the real bedrock of any career in banking is integrity. Ultimately, if you don't have trust, you don't have banking. I'm Rajesh Mehta. I've just concluded a 40-year career as an international banker. I did 12 different jobs in eight different countries in four different continents. My last job was running a large regional business for the same employer I've been with for 40 years, spanning 16 countries, including India, China, ASEAN, and all the others. In careers in an organization, there is a lot of energy that gets dissipated by people having to guess what you want, who you are, what you stand for. So be transparent. How does one transition into a leadership position? But I think the place that I would start it with, sorry for the long answer, but I guess I was trying to summarize 40 years. Leaders must be authentic, which means they must be occasionally fallible, they must be occasionally vulnerable, they must not always have the answer. What is the common myth that we know about banking, but you think it's completely not true? I think the biggest myth is that... What are the key banking trends? Okay, so I would list five or six. How do you work with different generations? You have to take away the judgment of one model is right, one model is wrong, it's just different. If somebody is joining banking today, what should they expect? I think they should expect frequent change, a fast evolution along all the vectors that we've talked about, and, and, uh, and essentially... What do we need to know about your life and career to set the scenes for the listeners and the people who watch the podcast? I was born in India a long time ago. <laughs> I grew up all over the country. I spent uh, my formative years in eight different schools all over India. Um, I've always been fascinated by travel and globality and always had an aspiration to join a company that would give me the opportunity to work all over the world with different cultures across borders. And so I shaped what I wanted to do around that. The second thing is I was a sportsman. I played competitive squash at national level through my university years uh, and my, uh, my MBA. And I was very fortunate that I was hired after my MBA off campus by my employer, the same employer I was with all through my working life. All right. So you were in banking for 40 years. What are the qualities that you think are essential for someone to thrive in this um, industry, in the banking? Look, I think some of the qualities I probably will mention are applicable across industries and roles and jobs. But I think the most important quality is curiosity. Um, one of the things about banking is it operates in a context. It's the context of economics and the market. It's in the context of what's happening in society. It's in the context of what's happening with geopolitics. And so, in my view, curiosity is the core. The second one I would say is one has to have an interest in, if not an appreciation of, or if not a full knowledge of, economics and, and markets. The third is people. This is a people business. Uh, you're dealing with people. You need to work with people to deliver excellence. You're learning from people. It's an apprenticeship business. And ultimately, your clients are people. The third is an appreciation of the fact that many things in life are a trade-off between risk and reward. You don't have to worry about learning it. That is something that banking teaches you. But an appreciation for the concept is always helpful. The next one... <laughs> is resilience. And I say resilience because banking, given its nature, is a cyclical business because economies go in cycles and therefore there are good times 
and there are tougher times when you have to tighten the belt. And finally, the bedrock, the real bedrock of any career in banking is integrity. Ultimately, if you don't have trust, you don't have banking. That's very true. The integrity and trust is actually essential for any job. What is the common myth that um, we know about banking, but you think it's completely not true? I think the biggest myth is that it is boring and cold and heartless. I think it's absolutely not. Uh, I think because it's a people business, you will find uh, the whole range of people everywhere but there's a lot of good talent in banking and a lot of good people in banking. Plus, it's not boring. As I mentioned earlier, banking operates very closely in a context. And all of us know and read and discuss all the changes that are happening. So banking, like anything else, is constantly changing. Increasingly, you're seeing you know, the advent of technology, of new business models, um, of new societal norms, um, of geopolitics, uh, of regulatory and expectations and other expectations from all kinds of stakeholders. So it is a very dynamic and shifting business. So for somebody who's curious and willing to learn, it's a beautiful canvas. You have been in senior leadership positions almost all your life, right? So in your experience, um, how does one transition into a leadership position? This is one of the questions that a lot of uh, people at mid-level, even starting in banking, they ask this question. How does one become a leader? I think the right place to start is um, the foundation, right? And I think your foundation um, has to be a strong value system integrity, empathy, and the willingness to put an effort. No one's born a banker. I think in the early stages of one's career, one has to focus on knowledge and skills. Think of it as the hardware on top of which you're going to build the leadership operating system. But without basic hardware, no operating system can operate. I think as one gets into the middle stages of one's career, you move beyond the knowledge and the hard skills into things which I would call competencies, how to deal with people, how to deal with challenge, how to deal with uh, difficult situations and difficult people, how to deal with adversity. Those are competencies. They're very important as you grow into leadership but they are also transportable to other industries. The second thing is visibilities. And in the middle market level, I've seen too many people grab the promotion rather than range. And when I talk about visibilities is, if you've been in banking and you haven't seen a crisis, it could be a credit crisis, an economic crisis, a crisis with regulators, you're not, you're missing out. So I think it's very important at the middle stage, once you've got the hard skills, to get these visibilities and exposures. And I think the other thing is to yourself be visible. If people in your organization don't know you, you don't offer enough of brand you, they are unable to identify your potential for leadership and develop you. I think the third stage of transitioning to leadership is really to get those broad macro skills. I would say strategy and vision, um, crafting, how to craft from idea to executable bite-sized steps that you and the team you're part of can work towards, I would say the actual art of execution. Uh, people skills, because any big change, any big success, any big problem, it takes a village. And if you don't know how to work with people, 
Most of us, as you're in your junior stages, you learn very, first thing you learn is how to handle your boss. Do your job, handle your boss. Then you go a little bit into middle management. You have a few people. You handle people below you. But as you go into a leadership position, the biggest learning is how you deal with peers, peer organizations, colleagues, because you tend to start doing the sort of things that require a wider partnership. And then you learn skills like influencing, communicating, because you've got to bring people 360 degrees along with you. So I'd say that's how you transition to leadership. But I think it's also incredibly important to get mentors, to get people who sponsor you, people who will um, you treat as safe places for honest feedback in your journey to leadership. One of the things I tell all the young people who ask me this question is it's really important if leadership is your objective, that at every stage of your career, you do a self-evaluation of what are the skills, knowledge, visibility, the exposures you have, how high or where you want to go on, on the leadership ladder, and what's missing. And choose your intermediate roles, not because they are shiny and your colleagues will think you're doing well or smart, but choose them to fill those gaps against that leadership objective. That was a great summary. Thank you for this. You mentioned trust as uh, essential for banking and, and leadership. Can you elaborate further on other leadership principles that you have and how they have helped you um, throughout your career? Sure. Thanks for that question, Annie. It's, uh, it's something that I think has been a, an evolution. But I think the place that I would start it with is, once again, the value system. And I've always been someone who believes that the foundation has to have a couple of things. I would say integrity, as we talked about earlier. I would also say transparency. In careers, in an organization, there is a lot of energy that gets dissipated by people having to guess what you want, who you are, what you stand for. So be transparent. Let no energy be wasted by the people around you or working for you or your bosses on where you stand. Um, it is not something that comes easily, but to be transparent, I think, is really important because it allows you the time to focus and the people around you to focus on the right things. I think the other thing is optimism. Uh, we live in a very complex world. There's um, a onslaught of info, data, all kinds of feeds and technology competing for your uh, attention. And unfortunately, a lot of it is negative or scary. And I think optimism is, is again, a key part of the foundation. And then people. Ultimately, everything takes people. Uh, you could, up to a certain point of your, your career, develop on analytical and intellectual ex excellence. And if that's what your preference is, that's fine. But as more and more you want to progress, people are critical. So I think if you have those, this is the raw material for the sort of mindset that you need you know, to adapt. Because you need a strong anchor of right, wrong, what the non-negotiable principles are. And then you have that compass from which you could deviate and be adaptive. If you don't have that compass, you could go in wrong directions. I think once you say that, I think communication is super important. Communication with your peers, with your teams, with your bosses, to people around you, what your aspirations and hopes are. And the importance of communication is it provides context to both the people and the work around you as to what you are seeing and why what you're asking or trying to do is relevant. I think the second big principle, once you have a strong foundation, 
is to set a vision, strategy, and a plan, and be consistent. Too often you find people who will go with flavor of the month. If you go with flavor of the month, you lose trust and you lose the followership uh, of, of people because they again start guessing where the weather is going to take them today. Um, I would say, once again, coming back to people, the, the best leaders that I've seen and I've tried to emulate spend a lot of time on people. And if you spend time on people and developing people and helping them achieve their aspirations, you will find you attract the best people and you'll be able to achieve better things. I think as you go further up, when we were talking about transition on leadership, be the best partner. Working with your colleagues who of necessity you need to work with. So if you're a salesperson working with the support or operations function, is not partnership. That is a symbiotic necessity. But if you are a salesperson and you're spending time with risk people or you're investing in a relationship with, uh, let's say, the HR people, that's when you unleash some hidden power that's not there unless you've invested in, in being a good partner. The other thing, and we've talked about it quite often, uh, and you might smile when you remember the conversations, is about spending time learning. It's super important. And one of the things I've learned across these 40 years and being in leadership positions is when a model works, it's so important to try and replicate it. Uh, it it's such a a tendency to try and replicate it in every situation. That's the biggest mistake you can make. So I think experience and a tried and tested model could be an asset or a liability. So you have to constantly evolve, learn, learn, learn. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more later as we progress this conversation. And finally, I think it is, you know, be the change. People have to uh, look at you and say, with this guy, he's really acting like do as I do. Uh, and you've got to be the change yourself if you, if you want to change uh, and, and lead an organization. And I think one of the things we forget in all these leadership principles is authenticity. Aut authenticity means leaders must be authentic, which means they must be occasionally fallible. They must be occasionally vulnerable. They must not always have the answers. So I think this is super, super critical. It comes back to trust. Sorry for the long answer, but oh, no, no. I guess I was trying to summarize 40 years. No, absolutely. That's uh, I'm not looking for a short and punchy answer. I, I just I was looking exactly for this answer, Jesh. And um, the one you finish with, uh, authenticity, it's um, very much related to transparency because because what you think is what you say and what you say is what you do. But sometimes leaders are not transparent and people in general are not transparent because they don't want to feel vulnerable. That's what I've found. And they, they just, as you said, if I'm transparent and everybody knows what I think, well, everybody can use it against me. How do you deal with that? I think there's some truth in that. But ultimately, I go back to my foundational fact of trust. I strongly believe that consistency is a quality that is not talked about enough. And I think consistency is important. Uh, I think in any um, interactive situation where you're dealing with human beings, personal and professional, the more people that you're interacting with know what you stand for, now, that means your judgment on a particular issue could change. That's judgment. It takes, as you get to know more information, your judgment must change. But where this person comes from and what at the core they stand for cannot be variable. So I think the more you, you reveal and um, show what you stand for, the more conversations and interactions can be more productive. Yes, it does come with a risk that there are 
some people, hopefully not too many, who might abuse that tr ultra transparency. Uh, but in my my experience, it's it's few and far between. So that is not a reason, uh, given all the upside on transparency and consistency, to sacrifice that, in my view and experience. No, absolutely. And the thing is, even if somebody uses it, well, that toughens you up a little bit and uh, teaches you some lessons. So nothing wrong with that also, right? And others see it. Others yeah, see it. Others see it, exactly. That, 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 you know, people are being abusive of the transparency yeah. and, you know, that always comes around again. Then. How many positions did you change in City? I changed 12 over the 40-year period, um, as I you know, mentioned at the outset, across eight different countries, uh, but 12 different functional jobs or roles. Let's talk about um, what is your blueprint when you start a new, when you are at a new position? What do you do the first 30 days for 60, 90? Or is this the approach you have or you have some other approach? If you can share this with us, that will be great because, um, again, a lot of people are interested in these type of transitions because nowadays there's so many jobs changing, people change, everything changes. So dealing with this properly is very, very important. You're spot on, Annie. And, and I don't think there's a there's a... Uh, clear formula, but I will share with you and your listeners where I've evolved to in my learning on this. So in my particular context, as I said, you know, 12 roles, eight countries, four continents, I tended to move to, to roles that were far away geographically. And so the advantage of that is you have a little time before you move to the other role. So the first step is I would read, I would learn, I would research context. I would, if I was moving to Latin America, or let's say Argentina where I worked, I would read everything about the country, the context, the macroeconomics, the geopolitics, the people, the culture. I would then understand the business and the role I'm moving into, look at, you know, past presentations, business reviews, talk to people, and all this before even entering the job. So take that as a given. I would say that I actually, when I, after I would do this learning, the most important thing, if there's one thing I can leave, is I would spend time saying, whoa, that's how the environment and the challenge, the opportunity and the mandate looks like in the new job. How did I do my last job or current job? What worked, what didn't work? And I am very, very studied and conscious about what was successful in my current role. What of it can I just take and copy paste onto the new role? And what I must definitely stop doing, which worked here, but won't work there. What should I start doing, which I've not done before or not in this, this role? What I need to do more often, less of. Super important. As I mentioned earlier, just taking a, a successful model and moving it in another context is lunacy. So what I would then do is spend the first 30 days, and these are rough numbers, listening. Um, talking to stakeholders, talking to the team, talking to... The, the managers or the bosses, talking to clients, talking to regulators, and just listening and not expressing a viewpoint and just listening. By the end of day 30, I would try to have a good hypothesis on the lay of the land. I would feel I, I would have the starting of a blueprint of what I need to do and how. The next 30 days, it is socializing, saying, I've heard you, here is what I think, and start exposing yourself in the second. You've got to do the listening in the first 30 days to earn the right to express your view, whoever and however senior you are. And then you socialize and you adapt, and by day 60, uh, you need to have done three things. One, get some quick wins. 
To earn the trust of your team in your new environment, there's certain things you can unblock or solve or improve quickly, which show people and your environment that you're serious, earn the trust to do the more difficult things. The second is you start getting a plan and you start identifying. In any change I've noticed after this sort of 60-day period, I know the one-third of my team that are in who get it and who will work with me to get the change done. There's another one-third who are undecided, and there's typically another one-third who are never going to buy it. Uh, or difficulty buying it. So you start with the one third, you work on the middle third, and you try your best on the bottom third, and that's really it. And I'd say by day 60, I try and present a plan to my entire team and all stakeholders, uh, take into account any feedback, and by day 90, I'm running. So that's a, a it's a highly iterative, non-scientific process, but broadly, I find that works. Absolutely. And it's based on 40 years of experience, so I 110% trust it. You mentioned about learning and staying abreast with all the news, um, trends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a, as a senior executive, how do you find the time? And you, you just described everything you do and you have to make sure that um, you meet revenue targets, the culture is good, you have to innovate, you have to change business models and all this, you have a family, you have your life and you have to learn nonstop. So how do you find the time? I think you start by being disciplined on what not to do. Uh, I think efficiency is uh, more about what you drop than about how organized you are on what you do. And, and I think that's a tougher discipline, frankly. It takes uh, effort to do that. So I do things like monitor screen time so that I make sure that you know social media, doom scrolling, reading, uh, rubbish, takes up a little less of my time. And I ensure that I'm spending the time on stuff I enjoy and that I need to learn or want to learn. So I'd say, one is, you know, have a morning routine because that's that's quiet time, or at least for me is the quiet time, even if it's a half an hour. Uh, develop a habit of super fast reading some stuff, depending on what the title is. Slower reading, where you're fully absorbing, and then very slow reading, which I might put into a separate folder or make a note to sit and reflect with a cup of coffee properly. So that's kind of a discipline process. The second is, I was amazed how much you can simplify uh, anything you subscribe to. Almost every periodical today has, you know, uh, a morning five things you need to know, end of day roundup for, for today, uh, subscribe to sub newsletters of the periodical. So I've gotten quite good at doing that, right? Rather than, I try to minimize the time to get to what I want to learn, if that makes sense, by using a lot of this. Recently, I've started using an AI supported news scraping app, which essentially gets me current affairs, geopolitics, global macro in a form, which gives me a bird's eye for a very quick view and I can quickly see at a glance, these are the two things I need to read about later in the day when I get done. Oh. So I think that's the other one. Podcasts are magic. Magic. I use them while getting ready. I use them in the gym. I use them on my commute. Uh, so I'd say, you know, I'd say a lot of those kind of things. Uh, but it's, but it's, it's constant. And it goes back to what I said in the early part of the podcast to another of your questions. It's the curiosity. Uh, I think if the curiosity is natural, you know, this doesn't seem like work ever to me. Talking about the information and trends, what are the key banking trends that you see for the future? I would list five or six in my view. You know, 
some of these are going to sound very macro, but I guess, I guess one of the things that happens as you get more and more senior in an organization, you tend to have to develop a wider peripheral vision because the wider periphery you have, the better you can do your job. So let's get started. I think the first one is AI. Uh, I think it's topical. Uh, I think uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, but in no particular order, that's top of mind for everyone. The second one broadens out from that, actually. It is technology, innovation, and the new business models that that is provoking. Now, that to me is super critical. How our clients do business uh, is been changing. A uh, big part of my career has been in transaction banking, which has been about payments and moving money and trade finance and how commerce gets done. Enabling commerce is what I built a career around. That has gone through so much change. If you look at across the spectrum of tech, innovation and business models. So that's the second one. The third one I'm not going to expand on is ESG. I think we are well along the continuum between why I think most of us, especially after 23, 2023, understand the why. Uh, I think people are different levels of sophistication on the what we need to do. But I think in banking, uh, how banking is going to really make a difference uh, and a tangible accountable difference is still something we all need to learn. So I'd say ESG is the third. I, the fourth is geopolitics. And um, given I mentioned that my last role was, and I'm still sitting here talking to you from Asia, I think geopolitics is, is big. And it's not just Asia, whether you're talking Russia, Ukraine, you're talking you know, China and its position in the world, the growing uh, position of India, um, I think I could go on and on. Uh, I'm just speaking in my current geographical context for a minute. I think the other one, in my view, is society. Uh, I think the expectations that society has and the lens that society puts on banking since the, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, has changed. Uh, and I think if you combine that with politics, you know, and the push we see towards populism uh, and trying new political models in several, several uh, countries, whether, whether it's in the US, it's parts of in Asia, or increasingly in Europe in the elections as we see, um, that's going to have an effect and understanding that. So I would say those would be uh, the top six or seven, and it has implications for customer needs, for regulation, for talent, uh, and what banking business models should look like. So a lot of change we expect in the in the banking industry, a lot. Yeah. Just like yeah. everywhere else, right? We are just at yeah. the edge of seeing something completely different and it will come just like the AI, it, it, it came so fast. ChatGPT came in uh, November, 2022. Nobody had heard about chat GPT Absolutely. and then suddenly yeah. in three months 100 million uh, new uh, visitors and you know billion people using it it's just unbelievable yeah. so that's exactly and what they're all happening at the same time so it's yeah. a bit of a snowball Everything. effect exactly and, exactly and you know understanding each of them sequentially is a lot that's but understanding the interplay between them <laughs> is even more complicated it's even more com I absolutely agree with that so people who are in banking and listening now or watching us, they would probably think, gosh, what do I do? What is your advice to them? Look, I, some of this will be repetitive from some of the earlier points we've discussed, but I think curiosity is going to be very, very key. And I think if there's one thing we should all develop more of in ourselves, it's that curiosity. Because the amount of change and the pace of change is only going to accelerate. I think the, the second piece I would advise everyone to be very studied about is how much energy, effort, 
and input you put into narrow um, subject matter expertise versus broader. I don't have a pat answer for you, Annie, but mm -hmm. you know, I think the point is, um, I think the peripheral vision that I keep talking about. So you might be somebody in, you know, the, the the finance and accounting part of a bank, or you might be somebody in a sales and marketing part of the bank. But if all our learning and de self development is restricted in a narrow niche, you're never going to see the periphery, the adjacencies, which is where a lot of the change comes from. And, and so I think we, the balance between having a subject matter expertise, but if your subject matter expertise happens to be an area that's more prone to disruption by AI, for example, or generative AI, you're building financial models, then you're gonna to have, to, to have to widen. So I personally believe that build your own skill base and of assets and the wider skills you have, in addition to your specialism, whatever that might be, is going to help. And, and or, I think the leadership where you are operating as an integrator uh, as you go up in the leadership totem pole, that is another skill because that's less likely or less difficult to be taken over by a technology or an AI, because it, it, it's the sort of skills that are used to, to do the teaching of the models and the systems rather than be replaced by the models and the systems. So, so I think it's go wide and try and go higher. But I think having said that, which sounds very philosophical, I think we all have to learn adaptive skills and we've touched upon it a few times simply because I tell my my three children, this they're millennials, late 20s, early 30s, that they're likely to have three or four quite different careers uh, over the 30 or 40 years they're going to be working. And, and, and so I think having that expectation helps the mindset to get the kind of width of skills that may be needed. Everything's changing, right? The, the company, the, the way people perceive work, the way work goes. And everything lies on the shoulders of the executives to lead this <laughs> tremendous change. So what are the biggest challenges to senior executives these days? The number of stakeholders that a senior executive needs to keep satisfied. We touched on some of them, clients, regulators, right? So I think the first, first one in my view would be um, growth. Where will growth come from? And that is for, you know, for the business that, that the executive is leading and for their shareholders, right? Where's growth going to come from? I think the, the, the second big one is really future proofing. We talked a lot about the future. It is taking all these trends. We talked about several, I won't repeat them. Yeah, yeah. And really figuring out the so what. What does it mean for my business, my clients, my regulators, uh, my competitors, uh, my partners in the wider ecosystem? And so what do I do about it? With all this that's going on, what is the sort of talent I need? And I'm not sure that as a senior executive myself, that I have gone far enough along on how does this translate into the talent strategy going forward. Uh, and you alluded to it just now when talking about your discussion with April Rin, is the model of work, the type of talent, the skill, and its adaptability is going to be very different. So I would say, I think these three are the big ones. And I think the other one that I would be watching uh, and I'm not mentioning risk management. Yeah, yeah. This but the one other one I, I, I genuinely think is societal and social expectations. I, that shows its way, whether it's in, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it's uh, it shows itself in 
positions that organizations take on socially important current affairs. I think these are the these are the sort of uh, more complex ones above and around the base business that they manage. And related to this question, there's so many quite large organizations in the world. You coming from one, right? I coming from one. You know, Google, Microsoft from the tech. Are the companies today too big to manage? They're so big and so much change. And as you said, people start perceiving work in a different way. Aren't they too big to manage? I actually don't think they're too big to manage. I actually quite disagree quite strongly. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think uh, managing an organization, you need to get three things right. You need to get people or talent. You need to get process systems organization. That's the second category. And then you need to get culture. Right. And I think this comment on things getting too big to manage, it happens where and when one or more of those threes has not adapted. Right? And my, these are all complementary. You can't get two right. Right? But sometimes organizations outgrow the talent, saying, you know, that talent was great for 10 years ago when I was half the size, may not be great now. So I think there's a talent in the people. And then the processes, how much you want to centralize, how much you want to empower and process and practice thing. And the last is culture, because if you have the right culture, it's not a question of size. So I, I actually feel personally that if you get all three right, you can manage however big an organization. But if you try and take yesterday's people, process, culture, and try to manage a new environment, of course it'll be fail. And whether it's big or small, it'll fail. Talking about talent and uh, the younger generation coming in, uh, how do you how do you work with different generations who have grown up in a completely different time than yours, with a completely different, uh, you know, basic knowledge and understanding of the world. How do you deal with them? What are the best practices you found? I think the, your, the first natural step is awareness, right? And acceptance that it's different. Not everybody does, right? Um, you have to take away the judgment of, one model is right, one model is wrong, one, one way of doing things is right, one way of doing right? It's just different. So I think awareness and awareness building is, is the base. So the couple of the best practices that I have seen is actually having uh, various intergenerational initiatives to get the conversation flowing on how the generations are different okay so where and my learning has been the differences are along four or five dimensions the first one is purpose what's my purpose you know on the planet and what's my what's the purpose of work is very different the second one is style of work is very very different the third is communications are very very different and the fourth is you know the importance of work is very, very different as a consequence. So, so the differences are quite stark, right? This is my learning. I just summarized the four points. Um, and, and so you have to have initiatives to, to get people to be aware. This is how that generation thinks. This is how this generation thinks. And then you need to have initiatives around getting that interaction. What I found very, very useful uh, personally is two things. Um, one is reverse mentoring, right? Uh, now, I don't like the word mentoring in this context because it means that, you know, that I needed to learn to become like, let's say, today's generation. But I found that, you know, that the communication and understanding improved with that. And then the final one I would say is actually having 
um, feedback sessions. So one of the things I've done is I have a one-on-many um, session with my last role uh, with the analyst population, who are the people who've just come out of uni and into the organization. Uh, I used to do it once a month, and I would help perspectives that don't come out in the sort of voice of the employee or you know health surveys that we do for they get hidden because you don't see the generational cut so i found that very very useful so and i think um, I, I think once you have that understanding and awareness it's just a question of uh, having mutual respect and seeing the positives and the negatives the last thing i'll say is organizations have to adapt i mean in the organization i worked with you know uh, one of the things that's offered to new hires is um, by some of the businesses is uh, interview with us. If you get accepted, you can take a year off at partial salary to work on on um, a passion project, volunteering of your choice. Oh. That is, in my view, pretty impressive. It I is. think the attitudes towards sabbaticals and flexi work are you know things which have been done and can be done. I, I actually think there's more work to be done because they're gathering experiences. And I think there's still work to be done to adapt the employee proposition for them in that regard to give them that width rather than breadth, which is not a bad thing given our earlier discussion on narrowness versus breadth. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And uh, continue the topic uh, of talent. When you interview people for a job in banking, what are the qualities you're looking after, looking in, in people? So I'll speak, I'll stick with younger talent for the moment. Yeah. And with younger talent, I think it's uh, in the environment of all that we've discussed today, all. I think if I see someone with curiosity, and I'm not talking about curiosity about banking, but between their CV, their interviews, their sort of group discussions, if I see this is a curious, interested person, that's number one. Number two, in my view, is passion. And to me, passion doesn't have compartments. You might be passionate about opera. You might be passionate about sport. You might be passionate about collecting stamps. And if you show me passion, I mean, genuine, dedicated passion, that's for me a very good thing in whatever whatever field. And the third is the ability to work with people. And don't get me wrong, that does not mean stylistic. That doesn't mean introvert, extrovert, you know, social skills. It does not. But my judgment on the ability. And I think in an interview, for example, you can get a reasonable read on these three. It's unreasonable to get much more than that in half an hour, 45 minutes with the person. If somebody um, is joining banking today, what should they expect? I think they should expect frequent change. They should expect a fast evolution along all the vectors that that uh, that that we've talked about, and and uh, and essentially just try and be a sponge, because I don't think anybody is you know has certainty on futurism or a patent on it. Uh, and it is, you know, to sort of uh, gather all the fishing rods so that you can always catch fish. Mm, that was really good. We are towards the end of the podcast. Unfortunately, I can sit here, talk to you <laughs> for another two, three hours <laughs> on these topics and many other, because I know you are interested in many, many things. Let's finish a little bit thought about Asia. You've, you've been in Asia for how many years now? Seven years, right? Seven years. So is Asia the next big thing? Is it is the future Asian, as they say? What is your take on this? I wouldn't characterize it that way. I, I think the way I think about it a little more non-dramatically is you've got to look at the characteristics of Asia as it stands in the world today. And if I look at it that way, here's what I see. It's got a young, growing demographic, right? So, which comes with, 
younger population and a growing population. And what that means is you're going to get a lot more innovation. You're going to get more tech savviness. Uh, you're going to get more uh, skills entry into the workforce, right? So the second thing is Asia from an economic evolution is the new world. From civilization, very much the oldest world. But on economic evolution cycle, it's the new world. So you have smaller companies, faster growth as a consequence. You don't have so much legacy, so you can go straight into digital, right? So we're seeing, for example, in my business, cards are getting skipped as a ubiquitous payment form and you're jumping to instant payments and, you know, wallets and, you know. So uh, because of the youth on the economic cycle, you could start relatively afresh, if that makes sense. Because it's younger, it's more agile. And because it's younger, it's got a less developed capital markets. So speaking for the banking industry, right? Uh, you're going to expect more growth from an adolescent than a mature person. So I actually think that it's a point in time, it's its state today, that it has certain characteristics that will make it super interesting for growth vis-a-vis -vis the old world. And I use that world from an economic development point of view, right? So... I think that's one broad area that we have to remember about Asia as to why all the talk about Asia. The second one, which is you know, undergoing quite a bit of stress and threat at the moment, but still is powerful, is it drives the exports. It is a manufacturer and provider to the world, right? Uh, that is coming under stress for all the reasons you know we all know, especially geopolitics. But even with that geopolitics, the intra-Asia trade is 50% of global trade. So even as a self-contained system, it is very vibrant from a trade point of view, right? And finally, it's got some of the fastest growing parts of the world. You, you know, obviously at China, China is a little slower right now, but then you've got India and Southeast Asia, which are filling the void. So I think uh, you will continue to see that growth uh, and dynamism in Asia. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, thank you very much for this interview. And um, now we are at the, the beginning of a new chapter. I wish you all the best. I have no doubts that you do many more great things. You're just starting. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting time after 40 years to be pondering four questions. What do I want to do? How much do I want to do? In what format do I want to do it? And who do I want to do it for? Four questions, <laughs> which yeah. is what I'm currently uh, I'm on my do list. So with no, that, absolutely. thank you. Uh, truly enjoyed it as always. Uh, chatting with you is always a joy. Thanks, Annie. Thanks.